Uh, the topic of this segment is going to be understanding the balance sheet and just performing a quick analysis on a company's financial risk. Now, this is a question that we get fairly frequently, um, particularly in the current environment because we've seen interest rates increase. We're facing the prospects of a global economic recession, potentially. And one of the big concerns is which companies are best positioned to deal with this? Well, part of that comes down to the balance sheet. This is just going to be a really quick overview on how to analyze a company's financial risk. Uh, but we're going to, you know, th it'll give people an idea of essentially some of the first steps. So first of all, what is the balance sheet anyways? We're going to talk about balance sheets. We've, we've talked about them in the past. Well, the balance sheet is one of the financial statements and it's where the company records its, its assets, liabilities, and shareholders equity, right? So assets, meaning the property, plant and equipment, cash inventories, um, also some intangibles, liabilities, generally referring to debt or accounts payable, and the shareholders' equity is just the difference between the two. How much of the assets do the shareholders actually own? Um, and the balance sheet is often used to show a company's financial position at a specific point in time, and then also to measure that company's financial risk. Which brings us to the question, what is financial risk? Well, financial risk is the risk that a company is not able to meet its financial obligations, meaning its interest payments, and also its debt principal repayments. So the companies have to manage their financial risks in order to protect their solvency and also their profitability. And analyzing financial risk is a very important part of the, of the investment equation. You, investing in a company with high levels of financial risk um, often leads to very poor returns over time. So why is measuring financial risk important? Well, Having excessive debt increases the risk that a company will be insolvent or bankrupt. So obviously, as a common share investor, if this happens, you're going to take a major hit. So you, you generally want to know what the level of financial risk is in a company. Um, you could have two businesses that have equal earnings, equal earnings growth, equal revenue growth in the same industry, but they have vastly different levels of debt leverage and financial risk. And that is going to be an, an extremely important factor to consider when investing. Um, high levels of debt can also really impact profitability, right? So when, um, when, you know, the economy is strong, when everything's going good, a lot of companies will load up on their debt, um, because they know their revenues are strong, their revenues are growing, they're stable, they can make their interest payments. But if we enter a period of contraction, where, which potentially we're in right now, potentially we're going to continue to go into, and those revenues decline, well, the revenues are variable in terms of just how much product or service you could sell, but the interest rate is generally not, I mean, unless it's on a variable rate. Um, but you, you have to make those interest payments. So you're, you're still going to have to make those interest payments on the debt, those, those scheduled principal repayments, and lower revenue for a high debt company can very quickly transition a company from being highly profitable to losing a lot of money. Now, Warren Buffett has a really good quote on this. He says, only when the tide goes out, do you discover who's been swimming naked? Now he's kind of applied this to a lot of different scenarios, but we're going to apply it here to a company that has excessive debt or excessive levels of financial risk. Um, and what he means is that, you know, when the tide is in, um, you know, all boats, all, all boats float, right? So when the tide is in, meaning the economy is strong, um, consumers are spending a lot of money, you know, there's just, there's a lot of money to go around. That's when companies often load up on debt. It's perfectly fine because they're at the peak of their business demand. They're able to service that debt. But when the tide goes out, meaning the economy contracts, um, spending declines, revenues for most companies are, are going to decline as well. Then all of a sudden you're going to see which are the companies that are sitting there over leveraged that are now having difficulties servicing their debt, making their interest payments, um, making their scheduled principal repayments and then also refinancing debt potentially at much higher rates because now the risk is seen as being higher. Um, it can really be disastrous for companies and most importantly for the employees and the investors. Now, the balance sheet is one of the key uh, resources that we use to measure a company's financial mm -hmm. risk, but it's also important to understand some of the limitations of the balance sheet. And the main limitation is that 
asset values on the balance sheet, they're not reported at what you would consider to be the market value of that asset. That's that's a misunderstanding that a lot of investors have. If you see, you say, property plant and equipment reported at a certain amount on a company's balance sheet, you think, well, that's what those assets are worth. It's actually not necessarily the case. Um, assets on the balance sheet, these are accounting terms, and they're generally reported at what is called either lower of cost or market, less any depreciation, again, which is an estimate. But it really comes down to estimates. Um, you know, companies are supposed to, if there's a if there's a meaningful difference between the market value, if the market value is meaningfully lower than what they than what those assets are recorded at on the balance sheet, they are supposed to um, take a loss on those and re-record those at the lower rate, lower of cost or market. Um, but that's not necessarily that's not an exact science. It relies on a lot of estimates. Um, so you know, these values these are accounting terms. They're not necessarily economic terms. And then certain assets like intangible goodwill, um, they may have no value in the market. Um, goodwill particularly is not something that, you know, th these are purely estimates, right? So the, the, the thing to understand here is that using assets um, and then also equity, shareholders equity as well to evaluate financial risk, this can be problematic in some cases. It can be very unreliable. I'd say in the best of circumstances, um, you really need to use caution using them. But in some cases, these values reported on the balance sheet can be completely misleading and you, you, you can't rely on them at all. So an ideal balance sheet is what we would call a cash rich balance sheet. So this is, this is a company that has a large surplus of cash on the balance sheet. So lots of cash. This cash, we want to see it coming from uh, operations. So not that they've raised a bunch of money. Um, by selling shares, but rather that they're from internally generated cash flow. They've amassed a huge ca cash balance. They have minimal to no debt. So the cash balance substantially exceeds the debt level. So this is a net cash business or what we would call a cash rich business. And this is an area of the market that we look at a lot, like just a couple of examples of companies that we currently have under coverage, one being Dynacor. Um, this is in our, our, in our Canadian small cap research. They, they have a market cap of, what, $114 million, um, almost $33 million in cash, almost no debt. So about $0.83 cents per share in net cash, right, compared to a, a share price of $3 right now. So this is a very cash-rich business. Um, another company in our, uh, our Keystone's um, U.S. growth research is Fortinet, which trains on the NASDAQ. It's a cybersecurity company. They have a market cap of $47 billion, about $2.2 billion in cash. 1 billion in debt, so they have more debt, but much more cash, more than double. The, the cash level is more than double the debt. So net cash of 1.2 billion or $1.53 per share, right? Um, not necessarily a substantial percentage of the current share price, but still you're sitting there, this is a company that has a surplus of cash. And what can these companies do with this cash? Well, one, you have to worry less about um, rising interest rates particularly from a debt service perspective um, or from a repayment of debt perspective. Um, but these companies also have excess cash, which they can then use, do to do things like buy back shares or invest in growth. And that's what we want to see. But most companies do not have a cash rich balance sheet. Um, this is a very rare attribute. It's something that does exist. And as I said, Keystone puts out entire special reports on just finding companies that have cash rich balance sheets and are profitable. But most companies at least have some debt and that's okay. In a lot of industries, it's absolutely necessary and a reasonable amount of debt is okay. But what is a reasonable amount of debt and how do you evaluate that? So one way to analyze the financial risk is to do financial ratio analysis. And there's three ratios that are particularly popular when it comes to analyzing financial risk. So one, which we use quite frequently is the net debt to EBITDA ratio. EBITDA being earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. It's a form of operating income. Um, so this is the ratio of the net debt to the EBITDA um, or, or essentially measuring the debt relative to the operating performance or operating earnings of the company. Um, sometimes because you know EBITDA can be a problematic figure itself, Sometimes cash flow is sub substituted and it'll be a net debt to cash flow. But you're essentially figuring out, you know, how many times, how, mu how, how much more, uh, how many multiples to the cash flow or EBITDA is the net debt? 
right? And that gives you an assessment of, you know, relative to the company's operating earnings or cash flow, how indebted are they? Um, the other is the debt to equity. So this is a ratio of debt to shareholders equity. How much of the total capital of the business is financed with debt relative to equity is essentially what this is telling you. And this is a very popular metric. But as I said before, now you're using shareholders equity. Um, so you're relying on a lot of accounting terms. The debt is going to be a market term. You can you can trust the debt more. The shareholders equity, you, you need to be a little bit cautious. So while we do use the debt to equity ratio, you know, we, we don't rely on it too much. Um, and another is the interest coverage. So this is the ratio of earnings before interest and taxes to the total interest expense. And what is this telling you? Well, one way of looking at this is like, what is the margin of safety between it, the interest payments and the earnings that the company generates, right? How much can the interest payment increase before it essentially takes up all of the earnings and you have an unprofitable company, right? So all of these and many other uh, ratios are used to analyze a company's balance sheet. Um, these are really just a few. Each of them have their own strengths and their own weaknesses, and they all tell a little bit of a different story about the company's financial risk. Just focusing on the net debt to EBITDA ratio, because I think this is definitely one of the most common ratios that's used. And a question that we, we will get is, well, what is a good and what is a bad net debt to EBITDA ratio? If I'm getting a ratio of you know, one times, three times, 10 times, how do I know what that means, right? Well, the answer is that this really depends. It depends on the industry. It depends on the company fundamentals. Um, and really what it depends on is how stable is the company's underlying cash flow, right? So if you have a company that has a, you know, reasonably low net debt to EBITDA ratio, but their cash flow fluctuates from positive to negative every year, and you really don't know where they're going to be a year from now, um, that might be a company that you, you don't you want to see a very low net debt to EBITDA ratio or just a company that doesn't have any debt because they don't know if they're going to have cash flow next year to pay their to pay their interest payments. Um, whereas if you have a company that has very stable, very visible cash flow, um, maybe based on long term contracts or just very strong markets, um, then that that's the type of company that is able to have more debt on its balance sheet because they have more certainty that they're gonna be able to um, service that debt next year, the year after that for many years in the future. So I just, I, I provided a couple of guidelines here dividing stocks into three categories, highly cyclical, semi-cyclical and defensive. These are really just guidelines. These are not hard and fast rules. Within these categories, you're gonna have widely different types of companies, different risk, risk levels. Um, it's very debatable. There's no black and white in terms of what is a good ratio or a bad ratio even when you divide companies in categories, but just as a general guideline for highly cyclical industries, we want that ratio to be low, ideally zero. If it's a very cyclical industry, we don't really want to see a lot of debt because we don't know that there's going to be any cash flow next year to service it. Um, and if those, if they have a lot of debt in a good year and then their cash flow drops off next year and they have to refinance that debt, you can be sure if, if the, if the operating risk of the company and the profitability is lower that the interest rate, relative to market rates is going to be higher as well. Um, so what industries would this be? Well, like oil and gas producers, oil and gas service companies, mining, other commodity sensitive businesses, right? So in the middle here, semi-cyclical companies. Um, so this is a wide range of different types of industries, maybe industrials, technology, consumer companies. Um, generally, we're going to say less than three times. Now, for some of these companies, three times is going to be too much, right? You, you might want to really say more in like the one to three times range. But again, I, ideally at zero. Um, you know, ideally when you're investing in a company, you want you want the leverage ratio to be as low as possible. Now that's not realistic in all cases. And as I said, reasonable leverage is okay. Um, but, you know, once you start getting beyond the three times net debt to EBITDA in a semi-cyclical business, you're starting to look at what we would consider to be higher leverage. You know, maybe if it's 3.5 for some businesses four, depending on the company, um, but the higher the ratio, you're starting to get into higher levels of financial risk. And then you have defensive industries. So these are generally industries where you're producing earnings and cash flow based off maybe a regulated rate of return based on long-term contracts that where there's a high confidence that you're going to get paid. Um, so you know what your cash flow is going to be next year, the year after that. Um, these are often, you know, you, industries like utilities, REITs. These are capital intensive industries. They have a lot of assets. Um, 
and that requires debt. I mean, if you're in a capital intensive industry, you have financed a significant portion of your assets with debt in almost all cases. So we would expect the leverage ratios to be higher in these industries. And that's okay, given that, you know, generally speaking, you're going to have higher, higher um, certainty of cash flow in the future. Um, I, you know, generally less than five times net debt to EBITDA. There's some cases when it should be well less than five times. In some cases, it could be a little higher. But again, it's, uh, these are just really general guidelines. And there's more to just ratio analysis when it comes to analyzing a, a, a company's financial risk. You want to know a little bit more about the debt. Some really important questions nowadays, particularly in the current environment with rising interest rates, is how much of the debt is fixed relative to variable, right? So if you have a company with a lot of variable debt, interest rates go up, that's going to be a major increase in expenses. Um, when are the large scheduled debt repayments due? I mean, you may have a company that financed a ton of fixed debt um, at you know 2% interest rates and the current market rate is 5%. And that looks great when you're looking at their historical financials, but maybe all of that is due in the next year. And you, you, you'll you know that the company has to refinance that debt at much higher rates. That's going to be higher interest expense. Everything else equal, lower profitability. Um, knowing what the interest rate is on the debt, the level of the interest rate, and also just whether or not the company uses derivatives like interest rate swaps um, to fix their rates. And if so, what are the specific terms and when do these, when do they expire? Because again, you may have a company that has fixed its rates through the initial increase in, in interest rates. Um, but if those swaps are ready to expire, then they're going to be exposed to the market rates and that's going to have a major impact on the company's financial performance. So where do you get this information? Well, typically you will get this type of information in the, in the footnotes of the company's financial statements. And every company is going to disclose information in the footnotes a little bit differently. Um, some disclose a lot, some disclose a little. This is just an example of um, from one company. This is a real life example um, where the, the company discloses um, the amount of debt, the average rate, and then when debt is coming due. So in this case, the company has about $3.2 and total debt outstanding, an average uh, interest rate on that debt of 2.63%. And in the table below, we can actually see um, how much debt is going to have to be refinanced in each year. So in 2023, this year, the company is going to need to refinance about $590 million in debt. Um, now, if that debt, if the current market rates are significantly higher than the rates on that debt, then you're going to expect interest rates to increase. So footnotes is one. One resource. Um, another resource is also just talking to management. That's what we would do. We would call up management. We would, you know, clarify some of the information we find in the footnotes. Um, anything that's missing, we would ask. You know, what? You know, we we would have questions essentially to fill in the gap. So it's uh, it's it's this is really just a quick analysis of how you would you would look at financial risk of a company. And this is also tied in again to what the other fundamentals in the company looks like, but this will give people an idea of, um, and a couple of tools of that, that can be used.